directly. I also found that some people are already helping out on the GitHub for suggestions how to improve it. For example, having one file where you can install everything immediately. This is really what, what we were hoping for. So keep thinking about maybe if you want to add a module or you want to improve a module and be a co-author on the module or be the first author on a, on a module that you yourself create, right? That's, that's something we really hope because there, uh, you cannot know everything and, and there are a lot of expertise here. Um, we also uh, will have some questions at the end of the day, but also I, I will try to have some questions for this module too at the end of the hour. And um, there is this Miro board that we really want you to participate in. You can enter in your comments for the day or maybe suggestions or maybe thoughts that you have or questions and Joaquin will enter uh, in the chat now uh, the link to the Miro board. Um, and now what we will be talking or what I will, I will be talking about uh, is some of the basics of multimodal data processing. So often what happens in multimodal data processing, and some of you have also uh, asked uh, to uh, focus on this, for example, is that when you have multiple different files with, which have different formats, right? You might have some motion tracking data. You might have some annotations. Well, annotations are not already time series. They're just some kind of binary, something is happening or not for a certain event. Uh, also, you might have acoustics, which is sampling in a whole different Kind of uh, frequency right so you have different files that, that you need to align and there's actually actually before you get there there's also a lot of things you need to deal with uh, for example how are you going to synchronize all these different kind of data streams uh, we will go into this a little bit uh, in this hour um, some of which we're not going into th th that much and we have written a paper uh, james and i and uh, james dixon uh, we've wrote a paper where we try to say well how do you start with analyzing uh, sound and movement at the same time. How do you synchronize multiple cameras uh, uh, after the fact? Uh, and these things are covered in this particular publication. And uh, if you have any questions about that or if you have specific, specific problems, you can always ask us to have a chat and we can focus on uh, how to get everything synchronized for you if, the, if that is uh, possible, of course. Uh, but uh, we advise to read the, this paper as a good introduction for even before you start collecting data, what you should care about and what you should think about. Uh, but now we, now we uh, kind of assume that we have some data where we're going to generate some multimodal data. We've already, already showed you uh, in, a, in, a, in a fast way how to create some uh, motion uh, time series or a body motion time series, right? So we don't have to go into that right now. And uh, we also want to create a, uh, uh, some information, some gross, informa gross information about uh, acoustics that are, is happening. At, uh, um, so the speech signal is very complex, has many different layers, but we're going to extract one particular uh, information uh, uh, measure, namely the smoothed amplitude envelope. And I'll go through that module specifically. We're doing that in R. Uh, then we're going into the merging of the acoustics and the motion tracking. How do you merge these two files in a way that you can easily make use of, of it in your analysis? We also um, talk about, we will also talk about deriving kinematic measures. Often you have uh, movements of different joints and they, have, they are defined multidimensionally by X, Y, and Z values, for example. But maybe you just want to have a summary value, like the speed of the movement, or acceleration, or maybe the, the, the upward motion versus the downward motion, or the vertical velocity. And we also go into a little bit of the smoothing, and we also have a, a good uh, primary text that we can show you uh, uh, or uh, point you to, to if you want to know more about these particular uh, kind of procedures that we think are the basics of just starting with this kind of data. Then we also show you how to, once you have these time series da data nicely aligned, what if you want to check your data with more multi in a multiple way, right? So we are going to show you to go to Elan, uh, load in your uh, speech file, load in, load in your uh, video file, and also we, we are going to show you how to manually check the time series that you created uh, in Elan. And then um, we're not going to do the coding, but then it's actually a part of the coding itself, right? So the motion tracking signal becomes part of actually maybe helping you to code when an, when an event starts or not, if you want to do that manually. So that's the ELAM uh, uh, bit. And then we have created some, let's say, gesture annotations. 
Well, how do we then have those gesture annotations also in your multimodal data file just in one object that you can easily work with? Because it's really nice if you, for example, have a hundred gestures and you can uh, nicely loop through all these gestures and extract some information out of it. Maybe the gesture speed synchrony, for example. Um, for each gesture, I want to know uh, when a peak in the speed of the gesture happened relative to some kind of uh, change in the amplitude envelope, for example. And that's something that we will cover too. And uh, some application, but it's not really much analysis here. So um, I'm gonna go and start with um, specifically with extracting some information from uh, the speed signal. So what if we have, here is our folder. Uh, this is our amplitude envelope uh, module, uh, which is in the GitHub repository. And what if we, if we have some audio, like a, a, a .wav file, right? So a waveform file. This is a waveform file and we can play it and it has some uh, information about somebody who's retelling a cartoon. Uh, cognitive scientists doing uh, gesture research really love uh, doing people retelling cartoons. Um, and this will have some information. Uh, oh, um, and this will have information about the, about the sound. Um, so I'm going to go to the R module and I'm gonna also open the R markdown file and also so that you get, get familiar with, um, with this particular way of working. So we're going to go to the extract amplitude envelope. This is what we've generated, right? This is the HTML file with all the information where you can quickly look up. But this is not actually how an R markdown file is, uh, looks like. We can actually run the code ourselves, and we cannot do that in this particular uh, HTML file. So we're going to open this in R markdown. So this is actually um, the exact same thing, but then uh, the, the actual background code that um, allows you to run everything, right? So here you see everything that we uh, load in a video or like a banner, so you can see the picture here. And this is also something that we start to work with when publishing data, for example, that you always have some extra HTML files where you can share your data dynamically, where your code is also embedded within the text. So that's also a nice way of working with it. So um, we have a bunch of wave, uh, waveform files, let's say of speech. Uh, and we want to have some information about some general information of what is happening in speech. And one of the information sources that is often used and is very characteristic of uh, human uh, communication is the smoothed amplitude envelope. And the smoothed amplitude envelope, for example, uh, if you uh, track the, the dominant frequency in speech and, uh, uh, and or the frequencies that are present, you will see that human speech is generally uh, characterized by uh, syllable cycles, which happen in about five hertz, so uh, 200 milliseconds. So uh, actually, from two to eight hertz, most speech, uh, the most of the signal is defined in that range, two to eight hertz. And actually, it has been found, for example, that the mouth kinematics during my speaking, which is uh, largely also related to the syllable cycles, right, that it actually is quite well uh, mapped to the smoothed amplitude envelope of the signal. So it's a really nice signal that summarizes when there is speech, how fast, for example, uh, or how um, how exaggerated, for example, a pitch accent will be characterized by a sudden attack in the amplitude envelopes or a sudden rise in a higher peak. Uh, also, if you want to track the rhythm of speech, you can look at the different peaks in the amplitude envelope and look how they relate or what kind of interval they have. There are all kinds of interesting uh, findings on the amplitude envelope um, in terms of uh, prosodic modulation, so uh, when something is emphasized in speech or not. So this is an interesting signal that summarizes from a really high dimensional signal, right, uh, a one dimensional signal, which is the smooth amplitude envelope. Um, in every kind of R markdown file, we, start, we first start with identifying the folders that I've just shown you in the foldering. So here we have, what is my current folder? So often uh, what we always do is we set the session, set as working directory, uh, set your working directory to the file, which is the script file um, to the current location. And this allows you to do relative foldering such that, okay, now that my script is here, well then my uh, waveform file must be one folder uh, uh, further, for example. And here, this is what this code does, it checks for the waveform files uh, how many are in there, it lists them, 
uh, right? As you can see here, it will have a list. Uh, it will list all the waveforms, all the files that have a waveform uh, extension to it. And then, for example, now we have a list of WAVs. We can we can ask what is in there in that folder, and indeed we have that audio cartoon, right? And we have an output folder where we want to uh, save our amplitude envelope to. Now, this is something you can all read uh, on your own time if you want more information about the amplitude envelope. I'm just going to run, run through the codes. So what we want to have is a function that can be applied on uh, in a loop, such that we loop through all the audio files that are within your folder, so we can do uh, like a hundred uh, or we can bulk process everything. And our main function is extract the amplitude envelope. So in R, we uh, initialize some libraries that we need. And we have a function here, which is often I, I will denote a function with a with a dot in the middle somewhere. So amplitude.extract. We call it a function, and a function has arguments. One of the arguments is what is the location of the folder or of the file? That's the location of the sound. How much do you want to smooth it? So uh, what we'll do, we'll, we will smooth the signal by uh, almost the upper, the, the upper bound of how fast is the speech uh, amplitude envelope goes in terms of syllable cycles. So, so we'll do it on five hertz here. I think you can also do eight hertz if you want to have a little bit more uh, information on the higher frequency range. And we're going to resample uh, our data, namely with sound, you have your sampling at 44.1 kilohertz generally. It's really fast, right? And it's a lot of information, but we actually, since we're interested in frequencies that are only happening at two to eight hertz range, we can downsample it, downsample it uh, a little bit. So we're going to sample it at a uh, hundred hertz, which means that for every uh, 10 milliseconds, you will have information about the value of the amplitude envelope. So in this, we have these arguments, and these arguments are the input of the function, and the function is going to do stuff with it, right? So we're going to read it. We have this rprat function. So every time now, you will see that this particular bit says, take from this package, rprat, a particular uh, function that this package has, and this is sound, read the sound, read the sound and um, do that for me. Then for Extracting the amplitude envelope will use the Hilbert transformation, and we also have uh, a link to uh, information about what the Hilbert uh, transformation is. But it allows you to deconstruct the signal in terms of its phases and its amplitude. And this is actually a transformation that we need to extract the amplitude envelope. So we do a transformation on the, the pressure waves, right? That, that's what in the waveform is contained in the waveform file. We'll, we'll do a, uh, a transformation, a Hilbert transformation on the signal, which is the pressure, the pressure differences, right, that you get in your waveform file. Here it asks, what is the frequency of the sound, which is 44.1 kilohertz generally, and we don't use the fast Fourier transform here. But, um, so then we have the Hilbert transform, then we take uh, the amplitude information from the Hilbert transform, because that's the information that we're interested in, and we do this by taking a, a calculation, which is like the, the length um, or the uh, complex modul modulus, it's called, of the, Hilbert trans uh, of the Hilbert transform. And we'll get you um, information about uh, the amplitude uh, of your sound. And then we submit with a handing window as a kind of filter where you say, well, I want to uh, pass some information at a certain frequencies I want to pass and the rest I want to leave out. So if we say that we have a smoothing of five hertz, everything that's occurring is slower or faster than um, at that frequency, is at, let's say 10 hertz, we're going to smooth those kind of uh, uh, information out of the signal. Otherwise, you will have really like jerky kind of changes in the amplitude because there's a lot of information in sound, of course, um, that uh, not, are not necessarily related so much to, the, for example, the syllable cycle. Uh, this, is, this is a way of um, getting into bigger chunks. Yeah it's, ways, right? yeah, it's a way of um, delexifying a thing so complex to get something in that you think is relevant for uh, tracking some um, some information in sounds that is uh, quite basic and, and we can be worked uh, work with further. Um, we're going to, um, some NAs will be produced because you cannot always smooth something at the beginning or trailing ends of the, the signal. We're just going to replace that with zero. Um, this is an uh, approximation function, just 
resamples, uh, sets your resampling rate at 100 hertz, then we apply it here to resample the data instead from really high 44.1 kilohertz to a 100, 100 hertz signal using translation. Uh, and then this will return it. So here, that's our function. That's what we're going to apply to all the waveform files. And it will just drop in the output folder all the output of the, the amplitude envelope. I'm just going to save this here. I'm going to run this in my R. So you can do this at home, right? Um, not now necessarily, but later you can run this in your terminal and you go on. And then here we have our list of WAFs, right? It's here, I can call it, it's done. If there were five in it, you would get a list of five different files. Obviously they have different names and we'll loop through it. It will say, well, does this file indeed uh, already exist? Because maybe you've already created them. We don't want to do extra calculations. Um, and it checks whether your uh, output is already generated. Otherwise it will not generate. You can remove this, but it's just a way to uh, do fast, uh, create the document quite fast. But um, it will loop through it. It will, uh, here, it will check what the waveform, where the waveform is, namely, it is your folder where the data to process is. And we paste it together with the name uh, of this iteration, which is one of your list buffs, right? So um, it will just make a location sound for the argument for the function. Then we have our function here that we're going to call. We have a location of the sound. We want to smooth it such that we have five hertz uh, as our uh, upper bound. And uh, we are going to resample with 100 hertz. And then we're going to create this. So um, if we just do this, I'm going to say this is what happens in a loop, right? Get my list WAFs. It takes the first one, for example. Now my WAF is this file. I will produce it here and I will run this like this. And it will take a little bit because the Hilbert, Hilbert transform is quite costly to compute, but you can just let this run uh, and, and do something else, right? Uh, and then we are going to write it, uh, write this file uh, to our output folder. And so we, we paste this. I see there is a double paste that's not really needed, but uh, an output folder with a new name. And we, we're giving the same name as the audio file, and we're going to ex uh, remove the .wav uh, extension that has four characters, and we're going to add add this to this time series file, the um, envelope information in the CSV file. And then we're creating this, and we're we're looping through all the files. So you can so you can use this code, just dropping your own files, and then run it, and then it will create all these, right? So. That's the whole idea about these modules. We have samples, but you can also take a module, replace the files, the multimedia and multimedia files with your own, and then you can just produce them yourself, right? Um, well, this is running for a little bit. Um, I think I'll, I'll just go through uh, this bit because this is the, so we've went, went through the loop, and now what we, uh, what we are left with is, uh, um, for example, we can show how the time series looks. Um, what we'll have is, I can show you here, let's go to uh, the output, and we'll create this, it will save this uh, file, it will have the time in milliseconds uh, for the moment of your speech, and then the first ones are not determinable due to the filtering um, at the in beginning and ending uh, of your signal. And then it will have values. And it's actually arbitrary units. So it just means more or less. So if you have a higher value, there is a higher energy in the sound. Um, and um, this is your time series, right? This is similar to a motion tracking time series, only that it is tracking the acoustics, uh, the movement of the acoustics, as it were. Um, so you see that uh, my. I hear that my, uh, the, the, the kind of transformation is still working uh, on our files, but we can look at this one. Here we can say, well, can we, what, what is a particular application of this? Well, one application is that, well, you, you might want to have some information about the number of syllable cycles. How, if, you don't, if you don't want to do any annotation, but you want to know how much speech is there, well, a good way is to track how many syllables are, are uh, spoken per second, for example. So here we can, uh, we have our code, we are, where we, we also want to 
some plotting of the amplitude envelope and we read, we read a, a particular amplitude envelope file that I've just shown you. So that's the audio cartoon here, right? So we, we save it into an object. Then we could say, well, for this time series, give me all the peaks that were there, the local maxima within the signal, right? So local maxima, whenever uh, there is some increase and a decrease, and in the middle of that increase and decrease, there is a local maximum. And we're asking for the local maximum here using the uh, R package. Again, you see this, the R package, we want the function named find peaks. It's also something you will have in uh, MATLAB. It's also called, called uh, find peaks. Then we say, I have uh, this particular variable. We don't want to have the time variable, but the actual amplitude envelope variable from this object that we have read in. Then we say, well, I don't want to have peaks that are too close together. Let's say that we want to have a hundred millisecond minimum distance between each peak and otherwise do not consider the peak. That's this argument. And we might want to say, well, not every peak is really significant, right? So you can have a local maximum that's really small, but you also have higher local maxima. But we can say, well, I only want to have the local maxima that exceed a certain threshold. And you can decide what the can, threshold is. Can you please give a, a, an example of where that would come up. Um, that is, there's a sentence or there's an interchange where, right? I, I mean, I know that you know it concretely, but my imagination isn't working that well. <laughs> and to figure out, okay, so this maps to, like someone's talking fast or... Yeah, yeah. I can show you maybe with this example. Sure. So the question is, what does, what, what does it mean? What does this all mean in terms of the amplitude, amplitude envelope? What do we expect to be? Where, where should the peaks be? For example, if I say pa, 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 you will have three peaks because there is a sudden increase in amplitude and, it, and we've smoothed it such that there is not small changes in the amplitude envelope that we really care about within the pa. Oh. Uh, and, and, and you cannot go faster than eight, uh, eight hertz, for example, pa, 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 pa. You cannot go really, well, maybe you can, but usually speech is defined at, at, at not, not faster than any eight hertz. So if you smooth it that way, we only get these gross changes in the audio waveform, right? We've plotted it here. I'm not going too deeply into how to plot it. You can just re redo it here. So you can say, well, I have my audio waveform here. We're plotting it with uh, this, this kind of function. You can try it uh, at home. And we're also plotting the amplitude envelope that we extracted, right? This has a lot of complex information in there with all right. kinds of frequencies, but we just want to have this information, the syllable cycles that are operating here. And of course, it's an approximation, right? Sometimes syllables morph into each other and it might be seen as one uh, kind of unit. So it's never perfect, but it is again, like uh, it's a trade-off between speed and accuracy. We can produce this on, if you have speech files, with not too, much, not too much noise, we can extract something that closely is closely correlated to the syllable cycle. So here we have extracted the peaks for every moment. And we can, for example, ask something about the rhythm of speech. We can ask, well, did, if I say pa, 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 it's really rhythmic. And you would show, that would show between the intervals between these peaks would show that your speech is rhythmic. You could also ask, well, if I have a certain ryth a rhythm in my speech, are you taking that over? Are you aligning on my rhythm? So you can imagine that we have multiple amplitude envelopes where somebody is saying ba 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 but if somebody else others says ba 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 then the rhythm is not aligning and that's something you can do computations on right is my rhythm is it something that can align with an, another one this is really beautiful that's and that's something um, i think as, as stephen is interested in as well right that uh, so stephen is a phonetician who's interested in alignment for example and these and these kind of uh, signals are a way to um, to track uh, gross changes in the rhythm of speech. And, 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 and Stephen knows there were probably all kinds of measures that you could extract from this in, the, in terms of whether there is alignment or not. Um, so just to show you, so that uh, we're extracting some peaks and that, that what, what it, will, it will give you a list on the first column that will give you all the values of the peak, peaks. The second one is the index of the peaks. And that's something that we're plotting here. You can look at that at home. But, so, you see that this is corresponding with this quite nicely, and we're trying to get some information out of that as well. And we can, like I said, compute, for example, the average syllable per seconds just by saying how many uh, peaks were here relative to uh, the second. Uh, and um, so we have some information about speech. There's more in this package, or more in this module, more background information and some references on cool studies um, with the amplitude envelope. 
in, in a YouTube on the uh, YouTube uh, link uh, by Cohen, which is really helpful on the Hilbert method on the Hilbert transformation. So, um, so then we have a speech signal. Maybe it's good to have quick questions here about uh, this. Uh, if you have any questions, and then I'll load in the next thing as we uh, go. So by the way, now I've extracted, now my envelope uh, has been extracted. So uh, we have, now it's done. And I, if I would go further, I can save it, right? So um, uh, that would be here. So now if I would do this, then I would save this object to the folder. Um, yeah, so any questions, let me know. I can, can see the chat. And um, if there are none, I'll just proceed to our next uh, next issue. Because remember, now we have some information, an acoustic measure. Let's say that we also have already some information about the motion tracking. Uh, and let's see, now we have these two files. What are we going to do with these files to work with them easily? We have to align them, right? So um, let's go to another R script, uh, which is the merging acoustics and motion tracking. So I'm gonna, if there are no, I think there are no questions, right? And somebody will remind me if there are. Yeah, Stephen? Just a comment. It's nice that uh, you chose speaking rate or syllable rate there as the first um, aspect to look at because uh, so many other aspects. Stephen, maybe yeah. can you um, can you do the uh, unmute yeah. yourself? Then yeah. I don't, don't yeah, yeah. So Stephen is going to unmute itself. He had a question. So, oh, just more of a comment than a question. Yeah, a question or comment. Than so, <laughs> yeah, just that uh, I think it's uh, nice that you chose uh, syllable rate or speaking rate as the first um, thing to to show here because there are so many other aspects of uh, um, speech, um, so sort of characteristics of speech segments that that depend on speech rate. If you don't take speech rate into account initially, then you're not necessarily going to get a good measure of um, for example, people adapting or aligning in, in those yeah. other measures. And often, um, often alignment research is often on the pitch levels, right, or F zero levels, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so that's also another part of the signal that could be interesting. So the tonal or the focal qualities. Yeah, my, my head is going to uh, an American poet. And Can you unmute yourself? Oh, because otherwise, it's sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We're just yeah. having conversations oh, here. Oh, this works. This works. Okay, sorry. Is this yeah, okay? You don't have to do anything. Okay. Yeah. Um, American poet, uh, Mary Oliver, um, and uh, she wrote several books on writing poetry. And she talks about poetry, of course, as being about rhythms and tones and sharp tones having sharp feelings, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's very beautiful. And when I'm looking at this, I'm so compelled to have, you know, look at people reading poetry and seeing what forms those are. But then, kind of reversing the process where you get a form and seeing how you can express that in different ways mm -hmm. to see what that carries, right? It's, it's almost like a, you can turn that time of year, thou mayest in me behold, to a waveform and then output it as some kind of pitter patter or, you know, some kind of a, a, a series of sounds and to see what kind of emotional content I just think that these are, are kind of incredible things, and you could probably model sharpness, right? Yeah, you yeah, could probably model yeah, yeah, yeah. smoothness. Yeah, right? yeah. The, the attack phase, for example, the, yeah. the how fast these syllables rise is right. really informative about the perception of rhythm. That's what we call the B center often aligns, which, which is a, a linguistic concept for when we hear a beat in the sound, for example. It's often and, and that might be, it, and that might. I don't know. This is your field, but I'm just. I'm going back through what I hear in my data set and going, oh, it's interesting. Sometimes alignment isn't having the same rate of syllables, but sometimes it's someone's picking up on the attack. Mm -hmm. Someone's picking up on, on um, uh, uh, a certain type of sound or, you know, and they'll change it, right? Yeah. So there, there, as, as you're pointing out, there are lots of places within this that we look at. And so this is, again, this is just yeah. fa fabulous. I love this. Yeah. yeah, and I think for the vision data you sometimes hear that people are taking over each other's rhythm to to take one's, one's, someone's flow and move in the same flow to make their own points. Yes. But then there, the frame is given, but what you're putting in there, if you package it in a frame that's already well accepted, right. then, so that's that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a, and, and this goes back that to I would 
would love to do for you. Yeah, you this is amazing. This yeah. goes back to the question that I'm sorry, I forget the participant's name online. But uh, when she said, what about agreement? Yeah, yeah. Well, this could very well be a component of proper agreement. Yeah, you can disagree on the maybe the content, although what is the content, but you can disagree right. what you're saying, but at least I take over your your rhythm or right. something. So right, that's right. maybe something. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Gregor is asking a question, well, what if you have different, so the problem with uh, measuring amplitudes is uh, it's really hard, right? It's really difficult because uh, if you have your microphone a little bit differently or you have the gain set differently, that problem is not solved with amplitude amplitude. You will get different values. So, but I always, I always use it as a normalized measure. I, I use it as an arbitrary unit to determine some new kind of information about rhythm or within speaker uh, kind of differences. Because for the speaker, it should be relatively constant how you're measuring that particular sound. But any problem that you want to have where you're measuring decibels, that's problem is, is something that you're not really solving with amplitude envelope. So you, you should normalize, for example, uh, or you should. Uh, of course, if you have a normalized, if you have a good uh, amplitude um, tracking in given in your settings, uh, and you, you make sure that it's constant, then they are cross interpretable, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you yeah. again, um, but I'm watching you speak, and I'm watching your hands have a type of amplitude, mm -hmm. as they, and it's beautiful. It's somehow roughly in concert with but not mm -hmm. exact to your speaking yeah, yeah but that makes me think that we can also get waveforms of amplitude also because what i've noticed that while people object to people speaking over each other they rarely object to them gesturing over each other yeah yeah that's true yeah yeah that's true yeah and that's that's that has been part of my research showing for example how can we show that speech and a gesture if it's the well how can we show if more what if is it the case that these are randomly uh, aligned or not and one way to do it is as well look at a particular moment in gesture that says something about for example uh, changes in speed and do they tend to do they tend to align uh, either with the time when there is a certain peak in the amp in the attack phase of the amplitude envelope or maybe the degree of the, amp the attack does it relate to the degree of attack in your arm uh, or in your in your hand and that's something that i found in multiple occasions that you often find correlations between if i do something vigorously my attack phase of the amplitude amplitude, amplitude envelope of that particular speed segment that co-occurs with that gesture tend to correlate so uh yeah that's something that i've been uh, quite interesting uh uh, interested in and again what is we're not quite sure what the what the communicative value or impact of that is and i think james is interested in that as well what, what how does it matter when we do that because i'm not too sure what how much it matters but we do know that it, it plays a role in the ecology of uh yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we anecdotally i found when i teach in italy and i make the students say the same thing but sit literally sit on their hands yeah, yeah. they have a very hard time expressing so, yeah, yeah and, it, and it's a hard time understanding what they're talking about yeah 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 i read a paper i think uh, gail as one of the first participants in my so gail has done a, a really cool paper on people with aphasia so that have problems of getting at the right lexical items for example because they have a brain damage but they still use the prosody and and the, the gesturing together like these speech gestures and they're, they're, they still have some sem semiotic value uh, for these people to even uh, to still communicate, right? So even when uh, the content of speech lacks, there is still content in the way that we are moving and and and, and vocalizing, for example. So that yeah. So uh, cool. thank you. Okay, so now we have um, we have well, you could say have a, you, you could say we have a problem on our hands because we have, for example, the motion tracking that is. Uh, sampling at uh, 30 hertz, right, or the same as the video camera that you're setting. Often it's the European standard is 29.97 frames per second. But we also have this acoustic signal that we might want to relate to each other. But we have two files that are sampling at a different frequency. So often this is really basic, but how do we merge this into one time series where you have one column where you have information about movement and then one column where you have information about sound and how do you align those? Um, so uh, for this module, what we've done is it's again self-contained. Here we have the amplitude envelope that we generated just yet, but it's here uh, copied. We have uh, annotations, uh, not yet here. Um, we have some multimedia, multimedia files. So we have some motion tracking. Uh, oh, uh, should not delete. 
Um, we will have multimedia annotations, uh, which is our inline files. I'll go into that later. And uh, some, uh, some, uh, some maybe a file that we generate in inline. And we will have, what else? Oh, we have an out output and we want to have one file that has, contains all this information. We want to have a file that contains the motion, the sound, and the annotations so that we can quickly, quickly work with this kind of data to extract something, uh, some, something that we, uh, we are interested in in terms of multimodal data. So you, truly multimodal data is whenever you're interested in that two aspects at once, right? Uh, well, I don't know if it's a good definition, but for now, let's work with that definition. Okay, again, so we have our session. We're going to set the working directory, directory to the current file lo source location. And I've just showed you the folders, and this is just uh, uh, identifying those folders, right? So the output folder. So now I'm loading in a motion tracking file. Should be here. Yes, I'm calling in a motion tracking file. And it will give you uh, some information about the motion of a particular person that is uh, doing the video cartoon retelling, by the way. And maybe I thought the sound was not working just yet. So I maybe, well, I can show you later in Elan. But um, there is somebody who is retelling a cartoon for three minutes. We have the amplitude envelope created and we're loading it in as env. So we also have an env file. And, um, and we have annotations that I'm, I'm going to go later into because. We first start with the motion tracking and acoustics. Maybe you don't, haven't done any annotations yet, right? So the first thing is, what is our motion tracking? Well, um, we have our motion tracking here. We have time. Uh, we are showing here the first four columns of the motion tracking time series, and we're only taking the first few rows, and let's plot it here. We have time increasing, and we have some information about the first three uh, or four columns, right? the x y and the trajectory of the nose so of the tip of the nose and this is created by media pipe so this is also something that you should be able to create with our modules and like i said we have the amplitude envelope also let's do the first few rows the first ones were indeterminate right so we start with zeros but also it's a time series but you will see that this one is incrementing with three 33 milliseconds uh, every iteration right every row but this one is is sampling at 100 hertz, so you get much faster sampling points at 10 milliseconds uh, for each iteration. So we have also might have annotations of begin time and end time, and then maybe uh, uh, that it's a beat gesture or a conic gesture, or that it's a gesture enactment in the our cosmos, right? So that depends on whatever you want. Um, but let's now uh, just do something like we want to have an object that merges these two, and what we want to do is well, we have this high sampling, high quality, uh, or high sampling uh, amplitude envelope, and it's the highest sampling rate. Maybe we don't want to reduce that quality. We don't want to make that in a 30 uh, frames per, per second kind of object so that we can align it. Let's, let's keep to the higher frequency and instead say, well, we have this motion tracking data. Let's upsample it. And we can say we are aligning these two data files first, and then we're going to say, well, let's fill in the values that we don't know for the motion tracking by linearly interpolating. So we have a point that we don't know, but we do have a point before and after that we do know, and try to calculate then in a linear way what that point should be, given that we know the time of that point. So that's what we're doing. The first thing is, from your motion tracking file, we just want to now uh, extract the, um, a couple of columns that have to do with the right index finger. So we, have, we make a selection. Uh, of column names, and then we're going to select that from the original motion tracking file and make a new a new motion tracking uh, file MTS. And now this file is nice and short; it only has four columns, and it will have the columns of the time variable because we've set it here. We have a uh, uh, oh, I should have gone down. So edit and take this. So here we have the time. The index that we have selected here, the i, the y, and the z. So the just we want to have some information of a motion of the hand. And if you take the, the finger, then any motion around the uh, around uh, the lower extremities will also be taken into account a little bit. Um, so and then we say we are going to uh, um, merge the motion tracking file, the reduced motion tracking file, with our amplitude envelope using the merge function by R. And we say we want to align the column from the motion tracking uh, reduced file, which is called time. And for the env, 
the envelope, you'll see that we have called that column uh, time in milliseconds. So we're going to align it with this one. So here we're going to merge this and you already see the output here right away. So this is here. Now we have merged the amplitude envelope information with the uh, motion tracking information where we say we want to have all values combined. And if there is a value that they will not align because they're at, in a particular moment of the amplitude uh, envelopes uh, sampling, it, there is not a particular moment where we also have a motion tracking signal, but they're now ordered in this way that you have, we sampled something at zero milliseconds and we'll have an MA for the amplitude envelope, but we have information for motion tracking. And then we have like three extra iterations because the uh, amplitude envelope is tracking much faster, right? We have three uh, zeros for the beginning of the amplitude envelope. And then we have a motion tracking signal on it. But what we can do is, well, we have this merged file, but we have, maybe we can say for every amplitude envelope um, information, we also want to have the motion tracking, motion tracking signal. So we can just do in linear interpolation. We have this value and this value. We know what the distance is in time between these two. Linearly give me a value that um, is a linear interpolation between these two points. And then we can fill this vector and all these vectors actually. So we can use a library zoo, which has a function called nrproc. So if I would show you a good way to show you doing this zoo, I want to have this package and I use this one. I use it so much I kind of forgot, but nrproc, it works like this to approximate all the NA values that we have. Use this as our time reference because maybe it, your your NAs are not occurring at a regular time so you want to have time information so you can do your linear interpolation between time points but you do need to know the time points we're not going to remove any NAs because at the end sometimes you cannot interpolate because there is not a next value but we still let's just keep them in as NAs and let's do this for the x y and z values so I'm now making three rows of coding Right, I'm gonna interpolate for all these three uh, columns, but it's actually, uh, oh, I have to load in the package, of course. So that's why I get errors. Um, now I've run this and now you will see that this is actually the output here. You'll see that this ones, these ones are interpolated. Just as a coding kind of thing, you can also do it in uh, not doing three lines. You could also have one line where you say, I wanna have columns two to four, I want to apply to every column, and if you would put a one here, it will be a row, but if, you, if it's on columns, you put in a two. And I want to apply for every column separately this Anna approx function, where the function is some function y, where well, some function with an argument y, and we put that in the argument of Anna approx, and then we compute it. And this is, this, is this, this is equivalent to this, but then it's only one line, right? So as you will, well, some of you will notice already that sometimes it's nicer to put something in one line instead of re recurring that. But um, yeah, that's just some coding uh, coding stuff. And I'm, I'm really not always as, as efficient and sometimes you, just for uh, uh, showing something, it's nice to have repeating code just for, your, for yourself that you know what you're doing sometimes. Um, okay, and then we're going, uh, because we have values, I don't know if it's here, we have now values for the amplitude envelope original sampling rate, and we have interpolated values. And we can say, well, keep only the information, when we had information about the amplitude envelope, let's stick that to that 100 hertz. And let's remove all amplitude envelopes that were originally uh, sampled at the rate of the motion tracking, because we don't need that. We want to have a signal that's now sampling at 100 hertz consistently, right? We don't want to have intermittent, like a one over three, kind of uh, the sampling rate of the motion tracking. We just want to keep the upsampled one. So we're going to remove all rows where there is an NA for the amplitude envelope where we originally did not have information. Uh, so that's what this is doing. Give me the merge file back for all the rows where there is not an NA in the amplitude envelope. And then trim all the rest because sometimes the interpolation at the end doesn't work. So let's remove those and we don't have NAs in our file anymore. And um, I know if, if I run, uh, run everything now, but now we have a nice complete kind of information with no NAs and we have a column here uh, with the amplitude envelope and uh, the information uh, about your motion. And now we already have something that we can really work with, right? So we can, for example, plot it. We can plot, we can plot this. Um, because we have a merge file, we have time information that is aligned. I want to, for example, here plot 
an A plot, which is this one, um, and I want to plot the amplitude envelope for a particular section of the, of the time series. And then I also want to plot under it uh, the information about the vertical uh, motion of the hand. Well, I think it's the depth for a linear pipe. So it depends a little bit on your conventions, what the vertical motion is or not. So this is the depth dimension, I think, for the linear pipe. And um, let's also add the uh, vertical uh, information and the, the horizontal. And now what you will have, if I, if I, if I do it here, it will show up in, um, in my panel here too. Oh, sorry, sorry. So here you have information. Let's see here. So here we're we have our time series of the amplitude envelope information about the sound and here together with the motion. Uh, so now we have something we can work with, right? So maybe now since, well, let's also look at uh, smoothing. So often when you have motion tracking files or motion tracking information, we already uh, smoothed the amplitude envelope, but we also have noise related information in, uh, in our motion tracking, especially video motion tracking is not perfect. You'll have small jitters that have a certain structure, um, noise structure, and there are sudden, maybe sudden changes because something gets out of view and you will have a large spike in movement maybe because of things that you, you teleported from one place to the next. These things you want to smooth out. I have, a, um, there is a really nice resource on reading about smoothing. Let me show you. There is a good book uh, on human movement analysis and smoothing functions. It's here. If you click on it in the HTML file, you can download the book here. And um, chapter three, three, the first three chapters are really helpful in getting some basics on you know, how do you decide what smoothing you use. Uh, also, how do you how do you differentiate, for example, so that you can get a speed uh, the speed of the hand instead of the X Y Z position changes. So this is a free book, really helpful to just also read up on signal processing. Um, so that's in there as well. So you can read this on your own. We, have, we are using different kinds of smoothing uh, options. So we're using a low pass filter where we say, well, we have this signal, uh, but we're actually only interested in maybe, for example, body movements are generally not as fast as uh, 20 hertz. You cannot move your hand any faster than 20 hertz. So if you're interested in hands, Maybe you want to smooth out a part of the signal that you uh, uh, don't care about and which are likely just due to noise related, uh, uh, noise -related changes. Um, so we, I think I'm not going to go into that this too deeply because I want to show Ilan, but here you can, here I would advise you play around with smoothing. Uh, we, we show several smoothing functions, a low pass filter that, which says, give me uh, reduce the amplitude of high frequency uh, information and keep the amplitude in the signal that has low frequency information, and that's a way of smoothing. You could also say, I want to have a moving average or a Gaussian filter where you say, I have one point here, um, but I don't trust the, this point alone. I want to um, normalize it a little bit by the neighboring points. Because if, if it's a random change, uh, for example, a random noise that this point is perturbed by, then if you average with the neighbors, that noise can be canceled under the right circumstances. So uh, I'm not going into that too much uh, here. So just now, I want to show you, well, we've been, sometimes it's good to always point back to the data. So you're, you're working with these data objects and you think, well, I don't even know what this means anymore. I just see a bunch of numbers. Let's look back at the, at the data and um, see what we have. And Elan is really nice for this because it allows you to uh, get the information that you actually produced um, back into uh, the, um, into uh, Elan. So I'm going to delete, remove the track panel. So here you have loaded in into Elan. That's that's something you can look up uh, the information about uh, uh, about speech. Um, so somebody, somebody's here retelling a cartoon, right? I hope the sound works. Yeah. No, it's just bad. I'm not going to have the sound, but you have to believe me that there is sound in this, so you can check it, right? Um, so here we have, um, we have loaded into videos, one of the video motion tracking that, that we have, so we can also check a little bit what is happening here, and we have the original video. This is an experiment that we once did uh, where we looked at respiration, for example. Um, and we, here we have the audio, but in Elan, we can have uh, also some information about our time series. And 
if we go, if you've loaded everything in, you have not loaded everything in because you want to load in your new awesome multimodal data file, right? Which has the information about the sound. And what you do is you go to edit. I'm sorry, we go to edit. Let's synchronize this. Linked files and go to link secondary files. I'm going to remove these because I'm just, well, and then I'm going to add my merged MM1 file that we've created, right? So in our script, we write the CSV file with our interpolated data, we write it to the output folder, and we can now say add, and I wanna add this particular um, multimodal data file. It's already linked here, so I'm not gonna do it. And then, I'm, uh, then I still don't have anything. I wanna have a time series that says something about the amount of movement or the movement that we have. So um, here, what I'm doing is um, I'm, identifying, for example, some information that I also generate in a script, for example, how to um, compute speed, I have a function for that, or how to compute acceleration. I'm not going that deeply into that. You can just look at that yourself. Uh, and so we say we have a time variable, which is an, a time variable, which we need to, to show the time series, right? Otherwise you don't know what, what, what time it is. Uh, and then we say we wanna have information about say the acceleration, Acceleration, and that's in our column eight. Eight. Let's have a calculating range by data. This might go wrong, but anyway, this is the things that you need to fill in. And we're gonna make something that we can load in later. And uh, here, then, you will have information about the acceleration of the hands. And here, you see a dip okay. here. So there is should be some acceleration. So there is indeed here. And then you can say, well, if there is an acceleration, that's the start of my uh, uh, beat gesture, for example. So now you can annotate together with the numer numerical data. So I can change this a little bit because I think the skills are a little bit. So let's scale it a little bit to two. Maybe this one. Well, maybe this is too extreme. Let's, let's say three. Remember, acceleration can go negative or positive, either a reduction of the speed or an increase of the speed. Now it's a little bit better. You see that every time there's something happening, you see that in the dips of the time series. So here is a quite sudden deceleration. Well, there's a really like this. This is the a sudden stop in your movement is, the, is an extreme deceleration. And it's also what we find here. So you can check with your time series as well. Does it make sense? Are there weird jumps? jumps? It's always nice to look back at the data that you're generating and maybe do the annotations here. Uh, I don't have a lot of time anymore. I think for now, you can go through the script further. It produces speed and acceleration. Uh, it, it tells you something about the smoothing uh, and, and further uh, shows you how to load in the annotations that you're generating. So in Elan, maybe I'll do that quite quickly. In Elan, for example, we made annotations of a tire. We can say export it as a tap delimited text. And we can export this file like this with begin and end times in milliseconds with a separate column for uh, each tier and also information about, for example, the kind of coding, the, co the coding content. And that file we can further load in, into our multimodal uh, time series. For example, maybe I can show it here. Um, you can load that in and you will see that in the script that you can use as well. We have an output. Um, so here we have a new column where often there's nothing happening, but at a certain moment we have loaded in, in this particular multimodal data set, also information about uh, whether there is a gesture happening or not. Well, this is a really long, at some point there is a gesture, at, oh yeah, gesture ID four, for example. This is a representational gesture. That's what the script does. And what it, what it will give you, I will show, that's the final thing. Let me see. How do you know it's a representational? Is yeah, we, we coded it uh, just for okay. our demonstration purposes. It's not something you get from a signal, of course, or not yet. Maybe if somebody wants to do a module on classification, it would be do. really great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at the end, what you're going to have is your multimodal data set. And what you can do then, for example, is say, oh, I have my multimodal data set. I have a column that says something, whether there is a gesture occurring. So give me the gesture ID, for example. A gesture ID is a unique kind of event identifier. Give me all the unique names and we're gonna loop through it. We're gonna loop through it and we're gonna give it for each iteration the ID. So maybe we have gesture event one. Then for the gesture event one, if it's not an NA, of course, because then there's nothing happening, we can ask, for example, uh, what was the ID? And what was, uh, 
for example, the maximum of the speed during that uh, particular event, and then load it into or save it into a vector, uh, and then we can loop over it, and that vector will be filled with all these values. We also can say, well, for that particular event, namely I have this event at these moments, uh, give me the merged uh, or the amplitude envelope, uh, the change in the amplitude envelope, yeah. and that's actually the attack phase, right? The, ch the positive change in the amplitude envelope are the attack phases, and then we can relate that here in such a way that we have now uh, a way to see whether the speed of the hand is correlated with the attack phase of the amplitude envelope. And it's just using one multi-model data set, and that's, that's the, easy, the, the, the beauty of it. We can just have one data set, we can loop through things, extract the relevant information, instead of having all these different files. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming you can also put the transcript in there too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So often you have another where you have moments of what kind of what is happening in the in the sound, for example. It's the same for the amplitude over the amplitude envelope. It would be nice to what is the content of the speech, for yeah, example. Yeah. You could say even, well, but what if a particular um, semantic content is uh, something that you wouldn't you would be surprised of in the context of it, for example, with the semantic network analysis. Right. Does that correlate? We've tried this, I think, James. Does that correlate with the, the attack phase of the amplitude envelope yeah. as maybe something that is exciting and new within the context? Uh, it's also something that you will prosodically, prosodically mo modulate. Um, yeah, there are all kinds of things that you can do once you have all these things merged, right? Um, but I, I, I'm going to stop here. This is, again, something you can do at home. Um, I to try this at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or don't try this. Um, yeah. So I think I hope this was a little bit. This is also a little bit slower, and it's also just the basics. And these are things that I that we all run upon if we first start to work with this data. But it's it's just the basics that we that we need to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? And I think uh... well, we have a minute left, so I can ask something for the sake of uh, discussion and prodding you a bit, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Since now, in this one, in this specific uh, uh, scripting example, you take the tracking point of the index finger. Yeah. Of yeah. course, uh, as we also saw in the, the Envision data set, people can gesture at different parts of their hands, yeah, yeah, yeah. being sometimes from the wrist, sometimes the whole hand. Do you think? This should be something that we also think yeah. about, that we use both, that we average. How, how should that aspect kind of fit into our processing pipeline, do you yeah. think? Yeah, I agree. So uh, there are lots of complexities, I think, when you really start thinking about it. So one thing you could do is trying to have the joint angles of every, uh, of every movement. Then you have at least some, you normalize also for the degree of movement that you have. If I have this, the movement is, uh, the movement or the speed is, uh, or the, the movement displacement is much higher than I do this, but maybe the rhythms are just as important. So you could also say, well, I want to normalize uh, for each particular joint the movement and then add it, for example. What people also, often also do is, I, I care about all these body points, so I'll just say, I'll difference them, difference them all and then sum them up. Uh, so it depends a little bit of what you're interested in. Um, but yes, I think uh, just taking the index is not really something that you always want to do. Uh, and uh, maybe you're as interested or more interested in what body part is moving. For example, the arm has a much higher mass. So in my own research, that would be interesting because the mass is also affecting the, the, the kind of impulse that you create on your body instead of, of only the wrist, for example. So, uh, or a wrist motion. So yeah, I mean it's like a it's like a violin or a cello, right? I mean, violin does a lot right here. A yeah. cello does a lot here with yeah. this also, and it's you have to scope each one differently. You can't just it. Yeah, and it can be just as significant. So a hand right. shape, a small change in the hand shape can be more significant in the semiotic ecology of the context right. than uh, than a movement of the hand that is larger. So yeah, these are all depending on the kind of uh, questions that you have. I see that Julia has a, has a question too. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's just because you show uh, some more like correlational approach to uh, what kind of gesture is associated with uh, what kind of speech. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm completely um, I'm studying movement, so I'm, I'm, I mean, the vocabulary I'm using for uh, semantic content is completely wrong, I think. Um, but in movement, I've seen now that we also check um, sort of leader follower aspects. So um, um, I'm, I'm really at the beginning of that. Uh, but instead of having purely coalitional aspect, more like a cross bablet coherent to see, I mean, what what came first and what uh, what followed each other. So this is something that can also be implemented, I guess, with uh, a yeah. Multiple approach. Yeah, definitely. So now you have you have these two uh, columns. You can just enter them in a cross wavelet analysis, right? I was actually working on a module. I didn't finish it, but um, uh, maybe you want to participate because you're working on it anyway. Uh, but on cross wavelet analysis, where you say we have these two kind of systems, uh, what is the phase relation? So who's following or leading indeed? Mm. Or how much are they correlated? Right. And at what particular frequencies, for example, we can ask whether particular movement, particular body movements have a lower kind of uh, temporal uh, resolution, right? So our arms are a little bit slower. And you could actually, as you know, with cross wavelet, you can see at what particular kind of temporal. Um, uh, time scales or just time scales are yeah. these correlating. So that's really, uh, and we, I've done some uh, studies on uh, cross wavelet with looking at speech and focusing uh, our speech and gestures uh, in, a, in a paper as well. So I really, yeah, I like it. I like the approach. One thing with cross wavelet, cross wavelet analysis, it does require, it kind of assumes that these two systems operate at similar time scales. So they cannot yeah. be really fully rhythmic coupling. So that's why I sometimes move away from cross wavelet and then to allow for more like mm -hmm. one to two coupling or something like that. Mm -hmm. But maybe yeah, let's maybe yeah, because you're an expert, so maybe we can talk about this at some point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that a little bit. This is something I've been thinking about as as you've been speaking and and something Stephen said before and something that Julia said. Um, and it's the notion of I know I'm simplifying this, but the notion of agreement being uh, uh, mimetic, strictly mimetic. Um, everybody gets lockstep as opposed to, and that being valuable in and of itself, as opposed to transformations being valuable, as in what you mentioned before, uh, when that it's kind of like someone picks up on somebody's rhythm, but they take it in a new direction. Yeah, yeah. And in the case of generative design, everybody locking step on the same thing is not terribly interesting to yeah, me personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the ways that people can go counter or and then pull them together or do exactly the mechanism you're talking about. So my, my, my notes here are what are the characteristics and mechanisms of agreement? Remember we saw the four verticals play? That's a type of agreement, mm -hmm. right, in, in, you know, in, in a large scale. Uh, does synchronous activity actually equal agreement and is what I would call at this moment the build transform or the transform and build activity actually better for teaching and practicing design than agreement. Because in, in the design world, we always say, oh yeah, we want people to agree. Maybe we don't. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we want them to have these poles yeah, yeah. that are different, as you said, different time scales, different, that is reconciling systems seems to me much better than everybody just Saying, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, for example, with the cross wavelet, you would see, well, is there just some monotonous, monotonous synchrony uh, or not, uh, depending on the dips in the coherence value, for example. Right. Uh, and that's something, we, yeah, we, I think uh, also people are moving away that synchronous is always better. Sometimes asynchrony is better. Something, sometimes, uh, yeah, getting out of the rhythm, right? <laughs> or getting out of the uh, rhythm that is destroying the mood or something, whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, bye-bye. Oh, thanks. Thank you for the time, James. Um, break, coffee, um, tea, water, break, pee break, get some air. Um, there's another round. Um, well done so far. You're still alive and engaged. Um, uh, so, yeah. The break officially started five minutes ago, um, but we will be back here in exactly nine minutes.
So <laughs> you just come back at uh, at two thirty. And maybe it's nice to uh, mention as well. So now we really had the basics, but next we're going to do like a deep dive into deep learning and. Uh, uh, and then, yeah. I, I didn't want to spoil it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and as an yeah. intro, as an intro, I'm going to give um, yeah. for for Gerard. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's we still have a lot of intense and interesting things for you to ponder on the first day. Um, it's going to be a bit of a zooming out. So just uh, enjoy your coffee and, and uh, come back refreshed. And we see you here in uh, eight minutes now. And current, current new developments that are uh, uh, that have been uh, appearing in the last few years. So all of you know that AI is uh, a very fast paced uh, field nowadays. Every basically every week I'm seeing exciting new papers and uh, every month I'm seeing things that I thought wouldn't have been possible. Uh, a couple of years ago, and so I'm constantly being surprised myself by what is possible uh, with AI. And so this talk is going to give a glimpse of, uh, or well, we'll we'll go into various sub areas of all these new developments. Um, before I start with the very uh, generic uh, uh, developments that are going on, just Briefly, what is artificial intelligence? We all kind of have certain associations. When we hear this word artificial intelligence, um, some of us think about robots, some of us think about self-driving cars. Um, but basically, when we talk about AI, we mean very mundane things, sometimes even like, uh, like when, whenever you type in something into Google, and Google nowadays uses AI algorithms just to figure out which search engine answers are going to be the most appropriate. Um, so the traditional search techniques have been replaced by smarter AI techniques that are just understanding what exactly uh, you're probably looking for. Or whenever you're shopping online or, or you're browsing YouTube, you get certain recommendations, which uh, videos to watch next, which products to buy next. And so that also is an instance of AI and also uh, video background. So uh, you can see here, I'm using a Zoom background, uh, just replacing the background is also an instance of AI, uh, figuring out which parts of the picture belong to me uh, or myself and which parts are the background. Very simple uh, problem, but it's not that easy just to uh, do this at a high level of accuracy for various different uh, uh, skin colors and different kinds of environments. And so this also requires AI. So AI is everywhere and uh, shaping all sorts of different uh, different fields in, in science, different uh, areas in industry and consumer technology, but also uh, allowing us to do exciting new things. So what is driving much of this uh, new, uh, these new developments? Of course, many of you know it's a lot of machine learning. So where you, instead of teaching, uh, instead of hand coding a lot of things, you just show the system a few examples of what you're looking for. And then the system builds up a model of that. And um, then when you get a new input, it can kind of figure out, okay, this new input looks a little bit like the ones you label as negative, so this is maybe a negative uh, document or uh, an instance of uh, happy emotion in a video. And so just based on these sorts of inferences, um, if you train a system, they can generalize and do new things. Um, so in AI, you had right in the beginning, mostly rule-based systems where you had a lot of hard-coded things. Um, so when uh, example is uh, the chatbot Eliza. If you would say something like, I like cats, it would just say, tell me more about cats. So this was just a hard coded rule and you would have many of these rules and basically use some heuristics to choose which ones to apply. And with that, you could have already some sort of engaging chatbot where people would sometimes spend hours and feel that it's a rewarding experience. Uh, so I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and then machine learning came along and enabled us to no longer have to 
come up with every possible scenario and hard code everything. And so we just learn from data and can do more interesting things with machine learning. But of course, machine learning is the traditional forms of machine learning work well if you have some very specific features in your input. And then based on those features, you can more or less directly predict whatever you're trying to predict. Like given some keyword used in the text, I'll say this is a positive review because it's, it's using the word spectacular, something simple as that. So the machine learning is just figuring out which signals in the input are go in one direction or the other, correspond to one class or the other. But then nowadays we have uh, better and better deep learning where you don't even need to have this, these ready-made features. You can just provide your raw data into the system and then the system figures out how to change the representation of that data into something where it can actually figure out uh, uh, what the data means and do meaningful predictions. So in a raw picture, for example, it's all just individual pixels that are colored and the system would have a hard time saying that if the third pixel in row three is uh, blue, then this is a happy emotion being conveyed. But uh, by transforming this whole input space and learning how to do recognize uh, new uh, kinds of phenomena and uh, create new representations, the system can generalize better and do way more steps automatically. Instead of us having to come up with features, it just figures out new features. And so in this first part, I'll talk about some of the developments now in, in computer vision, um, learning from multimodal signals. Um, so when we as a human uh, or even as a monkey, when we are presented certain kinds of objects or uh, 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 stimuli, we can uh, we often uh, have quite similar reactions based on what something is. Is it uh, an animal? Is it uh, does it have a face? Is it uh, an artifact? And so, by clustering these stimuli, you actually can observe that there is some sort of representation there that uh, makes sense from a taxonomic point of view. There's some sort of organizational uh, structure there where so that all the living beings kind of fall into one subtree and uh, food items fall into another. And so this sort of th this sort of uh, phenomenon is not present in the raw pixel data data. So we need to come up with ways to uh, come to, to automatically infer representations such that different kinds of dogs will have similar representations, although the pictures look very different. Some of them have a blue background, some of them have a black background. Um, there are small dogs, big dogs, uh, just the face of a dog, the whole dog. So all these different images, initially to a computer, they will look very different. They're completely different colors, different shapes, and so on. So how does the system do this? Um, first of all, you need some good training data. Um, at least historically, we needed uh, very good training data to achieve this. And some of you might know ImageNet. This was this resource uh, uh, created by, by Fifi Lee's team. Um, basically, they just labeled huge amounts of data, um, huge amounts of pictures from the web and signed labels to them. And then these, images could be used to train these deep neural networks. And typically we would use convolutional neural networks that need to then uh, make a prediction given the input. And so the challenge here was, as I mentioned, these inputs can look very different to a computer, but in the end, they all should, very different images can get the same label. Um, and also very similar looking pictures sometimes uh, might get a different label. Um, so these convolutional neural networks, probably many of you have already heard of them, uh, how they work. They're basically looking for um, patterns uh, in the data. And so you apply these little masks that you slide over the image, and then you get some sort of output activation uh, map that is telling you, well, this pattern doesn't seem to exist in this part. It does seem to exist in this part. 
Um, and so overall, initially these patterns would be completely random. The computer doesn't know which patterns to look for, but as we train the deep neural network um, and tell it which mistakes it's making, it will automatically learn to uh, identify certain kinds of patterns and the initial layer would typically look for uh, different kinds of lines, uh, different directions. So uh, these are some visualizations of these initial patterns. And if you go back to the original images, these are some of the image patches that were matched. And so you can see it's looking for shapes and also for certain colors. And then what, based on the maps of activations of these initial patterns, you can then run additional convolutional filters looking for new signals. And uh, these new signals then can give rise to uh, new patterns. So the next level, after these very basic low level patterns, the next level uh, would find these sorts of patterns. And if you go back to the original images, they look like this. They are now larger patches from the image. Um, you can see, well, it's uh, generalizing a bit more to more complex uh, shapes, not just like very simple lines. You can already see some initial phenomena like round shapes. Um, and several of them, several of them are, are faces. And then this keeps going on layer by layer and the network keeps doing keeps finding more and more interesting patterns. And so the next layer is already discovering certain kinds of patches that have like these round artifact shapes or um, like at the top, you have uh, certain uh, uh, scenes with the sky visible. And then the next layer will already start grouping together certain kinds of objects like uh, faces of dogs. And then gradually this gets higher and higher level. Um, so now it's already discovering uh, keyboards and uh, uh, other kinds of, of faces, other kinds of objects. And then gradually uh, this gets better and better and you get ultimately to this sort of representation where it's at a very high level. So it's no longer looking at very low level pixel patterns. It's based on the training data and um, the classes that were originally labeled in those uh, in, in those in that image data. So this is how just a brief uh, review of how convolutional neural networks work. And then you can apply this to all sorts of things like self-driving cars are based on, on this sort of technology. Um, so instead of predicting a whole label for the whole uh, image, you can label every single pixel and get these sorts of uh, uh, highlighted regions and then uh, get a much better understanding of what is going on in an image. Um, it's also not uh, necessary to just use uh, single images, you can have different kinds of uh, extended representations, different kinds of other sensors to improve this. And then there are, of course, all these other uh, interesting uh, applications that many of you have probably seen online, like neural style, where we're uh, not predicting specific labels, but we're predicting new pixels uh, using some other source image. And so this changes then uh, some uh, conventional image into an artwork using uh, parts of this image as a source material to uh, give you a very nice new rendering. So some of the things that we worked on in our group was uh, how to uh, use all of these ideas for better video classification. Um, so we, this was a few years back, we stopped uh, participating, uh, but uh, Basically, we were participating in these activity net and kinetics challenges and uh, um, mainly one of my students who was very uh, uh, deep into uh, video and so he won uh, the, the uh, first place in, in some of these competitions and the um, goal is to you, you get a very short clip uh, an excerpt of a YouTube video and then there are a whole bunch of different 
uh, activity classes and you need to uh, predict the right one. And so this works quite similarly to uh, what I just presented. You have the convolutional neural network, but then you have separate outputs for uh, every uh, scene, every picture in the video stream. And so you need to somehow aggregate and make an overall prediction. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of different uh, things you can do to make that uh, efficient and um, need uh, require as little as possible uh, in terms of the data and labeling. So some of the things we looked at is how to scale it up to much bigger, longer videos, because most of these techniques, they work for short clips, but many YouTube videos are now like 20 minutes long. So how do you still um, get significant parts of the video uh, incorporated? Um, and so this is something we applied to then um, millions of YouTube videos. For that, we also had to deal with lots of efficiency aspects, and um, that was quite a challenge. Another challenge we faced was how to generalize from um, some of the beyond some of the labeling that we had, because in YouTube, there are all sorts of things that people are uploading. And so the labeling has some of the initial data sets had just 100 classes of activities. And so we want the system to be able to guess certain activities, even if there's no labeled data in the label inventory. And so there were some ideas using um, external textual data and other kinds of uh, signals to improve uh, this, what's called zero shot learning of, of categories. Um, another kind of fun project, this was uh, not one of my main areas of research, but I had a collaboration with some uh, researchers in China. As, as was mentioned before, I, I spent several years in, in China. And so this was a collaboration where we were tracking people uh, in uh, video stream. Well, actually, it was a connect, so RGBD stream. And there, um, one of the challenges that comes up is occlusion. So if one person is standing behind another person, then you no longer know where they are. Uh, I mean, you can sort of guess that they're probably still there uh, where they were, but they could also be included for a longer period of time. And sometimes uh, people are moving and uh, you kind of lose track. And so this, kind of, this little fun project was about, uh, can we use the shadows on the floor to improve and enhance the tracking? And it seemed to work quite well, uh, at least in, in the scenarios we considered. Uh, it's not super robust, uh, ready for, for any scenario. Uh, these were controlled settings in an indoor location, but in general, uh, it, it was an interesting idea that that uh, could be uh, incorporated also into uh, uh, additional tracking tools. All right, so uh, moving away from our own research, so there are things people are doing now with video that can be very interesting, like monitoring uh, uh, primates and in, in nature for over long periods of time and then assessing that data for that you need activity labels so things like eating nut cracking and so on and then you can keep track of different kinds of activities and how many uh, primates are involved and what kind of social phenomena do you observe um, one of the things that we've been interested in also is uh, can we capture relationships and interactions. So here, one prominent resource is called Visual Genome. Um, basically, they have bounding boxes of different uh, objects or, or, or other uh, uh, observations in the image, but they also have this graph structure where they're describing what is going on. There's a hat on the dog, and that dog is on the motorcycle. Um, the motorcycle has a handle. So instead of just having boxes that you then can quantify, uh, count how often they appear, when they appear, you have this very uh, interesting structure that captures all the relationships. Um, so one 
One nice thing about it is it's very densely labeled. Uh, so each image has a huge number of labelings. Um, and so these graphs are, are very useful, uh, but you still need to then figure out how to use these graphs because it can also be overwhelming to have so much data to analyze that you get then from, from every image. Uh, so here's another example of an, uh, in fact, beyond just the, in the initial graph, you can also uh, generalize and uh, connect these sorts of graphs to other kinds of background knowledge that you have. So that's also something that uh, we're interested in connecting different graphs uh, into a larger knowledge structure. So in general, these, these sorts of uh, approaches um, now exist because of visual genome, the data set, and then other people trained models to be able to recreate such graphs for new images. So they train their deep learning system on this data. And so you can try then to uh, feed in any new uh, footage that you have into such uh, visual relationship detectors. Um, some of our research was also looking at, can we create some inventories of human activities and their different uh, relationships and locations, um, more of a knowledge kind of database. What are all the different activities we observe in uh, specifically movie scripts? So we looked, we took a whole bunch of movie scripts, a very large collection. We also took novels and uh, other kinds of sources. And we align these with the subtitles. So uh, we have the subtitles to align it to the video stream. And so with that, we could then come up with this pipeline that analyzes in the textual data what is going on, and then connect that to the corresponding visuals and create this sort of uh, database of, of uh, what kinds of activities we found and um, and have with corresponding examples. So other things that probably many of you already know is uh, we have very good image captioning tools. We have uh, also, uh, they're pretty much similar to uh, other kinds of deep neural models for images and text. So it's almost like a translation task. You're translating from an image to an English sentence. And so, Back in the days, we used to have very different approaches for machine translation and for computer vision. Nowadays, because of uh, deep learning, we can use many of the same techniques uh, in these uh, very different modalities and connect them and hook them up. So we can basically feed in a convolutional neural network as the input, and then the output is a current uh, machine translation system, and we train the whole system then to generate captions. And the same then uh, can also be done for videos. That's also something we were doing some research on. Um, and they don't work that perfectly. So for a computer to truly understand what is going on in a whole video is still a little bit challenging. Um, but you will get some output that, at least at an abstract level, is sort of correct. So very basic things that are going on would be described, uh, but not, not the way we humans might describe the same scene. Yeah, you use the word understand. Um, uh -huh. And I'm curious as to, I, in general, what does understanding mean? Oh, yeah. It's, it's I mean, I'm seeing a description. I don't understand this. I mean, you know, like here I'm using the same word. Right. Um, but in what way does a computer understand? And is it really analogous to how we understand? Well, yeah, I should uh, probably uh, put some sort of note there that when I say understanding, I don't mean true understanding in the human sense. So, of course, uh, true understanding requires all sorts of additional things like being able to relate. Um, the interpretation to the actual real world and um, figure out how the meanings are grounded in the world and how these, uh, what the actual reference are and all of these aspects that don't, uh, aren't really covered by uh, these uh, very simple models that just take an image or video and even text models uh, 
they do something meaningful with the data, but it's not human-like understanding. I'll be talking about uh, this a bit more later on in the talk as well. So, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure how I would describe, I'm looking at this, and I, I thought about how would I describe what's oh, yeah. there, and I miss so much, mm -hmm. right? And I'm impressed that it gets so much, but then I start interrogating going, it's really about shirts hanging in a closet or whatever, you know, that is the, I, I'm impressed by that it can select a person sitting on a bed and that the person is what's important in the room as opposed to uh -huh. something else. Right. right. I, it's, it's very impressive. Um, and again, just looking at it, I going, gee, I wonder what I would say. Oh it's, yeah, so that's also a big issue. Basically, you have people watch these videos and describe them, and definitely there's a lot of disagreement about what the best things are to say, and also how to evaluate whether these models, whatever they're producing is meaningful. Maybe they generate something completely different, but it's also reasonable. So um, all these issues come up, and I'm kind of glossing over them right now, just trying to give a basic overview of what kinds of tools exist, but there are all these shortcomings and problems that uh, are def definitely uh, issues. Uh, all right, so yeah, video captioning exists. Some other research we were doing was looking at um, uh, websites and other kinds of online documents where you have text and you also have images and so there are some ways to study how different parts of a text relate to each other. So in um, linguistics, people look at discourse relationships. If I write in my text uh, a certain sentence and then next I write, uh, I put in some other sentence, why am I doing that? And what is the relationship between them? Is one sort of expanding on the previous sentence or is it uh, forming some sort of opposition, counterpoint? Um, so all these kinds of aspects can also be done in multimodal documents. Why am I putting an image uh, in my document? What is the relationship? And so we've been uh, looking at this, trying to label this and trying to see which parts do people mention in the text? Which parts are only visible in the image? Um, and then is there something interesting going on there? Certain kinds of um, things can are easier to convey in an image. Other things are easier to convey in, in text. Um, all right. And then some of the latest techniques, of course, also allow you to ask questions about an image. Um, this sort of works, it's definitely not perfect. Basically, we're just trying to plug in the same kinds of uh, models, uh, use the same kinds of data and models as before, but for this new task. And so it's basically getting an image and a question as input and then translating that to an answer, so to speak. And it sometimes works quite well, like you see here, what is behind the table, chairs and window. Um, but there are also many failure cases. Um, here's some examples of uh, cases where it works okay. What is the color of the bus? The bus is red. What is there in yellow and so on, bananas. Um, but there are certain things that these models uh, do not achieve. Um, some of the issues relate to uh, higher level understanding. So you can ask these very basic questions about what is in the image. And, but then once you have to do some reasoning, it gets harder, like counting how many objects are there is already a very hard task sometimes for these models and they can be quite inconsistent in their, in their answers. So uh, like here, how many drawers are there? It, uh, it sometimes gets it correct, sometimes it fails. Um, uh, overall, like these are some examples where it succeeds. It's sort of getting it correct, but still these models make a, a lot of uh, mistakes. Okay, so these are some things that you could also apply and see if it works by coming up with a good question and then running that question over a whole video stream and then 
um, basically seeing when that question gets a positive answer that would allow you to do certain kinds of analytics that you couldn't easily do otherwise. Is there, is there I'm, I'm finding, I'm so drawn to the mistakes. Oh, yeah. I'm so drawn to when it gets it quote unquote wrong because there's obviously something, some pattern it is uh, detecting that is right. I mean, it's not from a certain frame in all the stuff you've shown when you said, and this is wrong or didn't get it. There's also the notion of, well, it's seeing something. Um, yeah, I mean, it's seeing these. So what works best is just figuring out what is in the image, because that's what it's really trained to do. Uh, find faces, find animals, but it doesn't fully understand what it's seeing unless there's really a lot of training data. So it might tell you that there's a cake and people and there are candles, but it won't necessarily automatically get that this is some sort of birthday party and that uh, one person uh, is, is probably the ch one child is celebrating their birthday. So some of these finer grained, uh, higher level ideas are, are missing. Isn't that what we love about when children make different sense that isn't the sense we're making or when psychologists, you know, whether it's a Rorschach or whatever, oh, yeah. talking to someone going, wow, that's really indicative of this, this, and this, because it's a, a different pattern. So I'm, I'm just, I know this isn't, you know, it, it isn't practical, but in some ways I'm finding so much kind of poetry oh, yeah. and, and <laughs> wow, it didn't get it right. That's okay. So what is it seeing? What's its point of view? Like when my son says something totally like, you know, I have to kind of go, why did he put it together that way? And right. I'm wanting to do that with this, even though it's not correct. Um, well, we definitely also do look into these errors and sometimes find very amazing things like, uh, like many of the early deep learning systems for translation. If you just repeated a word, it would just make up stuff. And so there are these poems that people came up with just repeating one word and it came up with some long text. So uh, yeah, and figuring out why that happens can be quite interesting. And sometimes we, I mean, they're, they're very complex networks, so we don't always manage to figure it out, but sometimes we do. And then uh, uh, that can also be very enlightening and allow us to tweak the models. And... So, so underneath it, there, I mean, would, it, there's a complex network underneath this stuff. Right. And those, the characteristics of those networks characterize how they make sense, as it were, what, how they label something, how they see something. Yeah, you need to look into all of these different small little pattern matching uh, matrices, and, but there's so many of them and so many layers that it gets hard. Um, so at some point, sometimes you need to visualize things like heat maps, what is which parts of the image did the model really pay attention to the most. Um, not just what did it produce, but what other things did it think about producing as well into those alternatives. Um, now people are also generating explanations. So you take what the model is thinking, basically it's inner representation and generate a description of that. Um, it doesn't work perfectly yet, but people are looking into making that work better, generating um, descriptive texts that uh, reveal a bit more about the internals of the models. Kind of like psychology. <laughs> well, not not exactly, but uh, in substance, yeah. you, you you kind of. Uh, I mean, we can. The nice thing is we can look into every specific part uh, and really see it. Yeah. The the bad thing, I guess, is that it's just so complex that you don't. You're seeing all these details, but you don't get the high level picture that you would get as a psychologist. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so one thing we were looking at is a TV series. So um, basically a lot of our research is driven by opportunities. What kind of data do we have? What kind of data is available? And so um, Mohit Bansal, uh, one of my old uh, uh, colleagues at, at Berkeley, he then went on to 
uh, his team went on to create this whole data set of TV series where uh, basically you have to answer questions about what's going on in the TV series. Uh, so uh, like, uh, yeah, like here for uh, Big Bang Theory, uh, there are labelings of specific uh, people and objects in the image. And then there's a question, what instrument is Raj playing when Raj and Howard have their show? And now the system needs to guess the right answer. And in some cases, it's not too hard because, well, there might only be a single instrument. Um, so if you figure that out, you can get it right. But in some cases, you uh, need to keep track of who is doing what to whom. And that's something that the models fail at quite a bit because they're just seeing, well, there's a woman, there's another woman. And these questions are about specific people. So our research was about how can we better keep track uh, of who is doing what. So instead of having this generic relationship, there's a man playing a guitar, we would have Raj just playing the guitar um, as a more uh, character, uh, more descriptive character specific relationship um, and so how to deal with this over many different kinds of tv series and uh, that was the main challenge here all right so this is a, a first part about some more well-known techniques in computer vision that have now existed for a bunch of years um, are there question, further questions uh, so far about this kind of more basic review of, of um, probably things that some of you have already seen in various forms. Uh, I'm not sure how to see online questions, but if anyone asks something in the chat, just feel free to read them out uh, to me. Um, so, so next uh, I have uh, some slides about some of the uh, risks and opportunities. Um, so, so many things have changed now with COVID. We're having so many online meetings and probably this trend will continue in the future that we have uh, telepresence and new solutions to make these online meetings more like uh, traditional uh, real world meetings. And, but with this and with uh, all this working from home, there are also uh, some challenges like Microsoft that has their Microsoft Teams product. They also have been uh, introducing features for, for basically bosses to uh, keep track of their different employees and rank them by uh, like on how many days were they active on email and how many days did they use the chat. So some of these things can be a bit uh, tricky. I mean, it can be interesting from a humanity's point of view, if you want to analyze interactions, activities, and um, how people are behaving in this sort of setting. But of course, there, it can also be a, a bit concerning. Um, and so Microsoft has their productivity score that they developed to keep track of, of how people are working from home, which um, could be misused or could be uh, I mean, there are ways to game the system, of course, and then uh, uh, will people get uh, uh, face any consequences if they work in a different way that doesn't quite match the way these scores are, are working. Um, a more, uh, a more uh, deeper problem is that some of the data, I mean, already we're sharing a lot of data, but some of the data we think it's okay to share can then reveal further things about us that we perhaps did not want to share. Um, so uh, many of you have heard of Cambridge Analytica and all these uh, 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 controversial uh, analyses. So I was, uh, it was mentioned before, I was actually in Cambridge, uh, UK uh, for a while, and there some of the people who are also working on these topics, like uh, given certain uh, info about what people liked on Facebook, can we predict whether they're single or in a relationship? Can we predict uh, whether they smoke uh, or drink alcohol? So these are all just educated guesses. They're not accurate, of course. Uh, 
predicting religion, race, uh, uh, sexuality, gender identity, and so on. Um, so these sorts of things are just educated guesses, but that can also be, of course, even more concerning because the system might, just because you listen to certain kinds of music, they might infer that you probably are an unreliable person who takes drugs or something like that. So there are certain concerns also when you go towards more uh, um, long-term personality attributes. Is a person well-organized or not? Is a person calm or emotional? So these kinds of things can be revealed just based on the language you use, how, what kinds of things you're writing on social media, what kinds of things you're describing. Um, we also did some research on this, connecting how different personality models relate to each other um, as evinced by data on social media. Um, so there are various different personality models and um, we can collect data for some of them. Um, then at the more, so personality is something more long term and then something more short term is emotion. How do, how are people uh, feeling at a certain point in time? And so probably many of you know there are different theories of emotion. Some of them are based on more perceptual features like facial expression. Um, others are based on uh, other kinds of uh, considerations, more abstract and uh, considering how they relate to one another. Um, some models are reducing everything just to uh, basic dimensions such as valence, arousal, and perhaps dominance. Um, so there are these different emotion models. And so some of our work has also been in this area, how to connect these different emotion models, looking at whether any particular model is enough. And there are some studies of uh, looking at how people react to different videos and what um, emotional words they use when describing them. And basically what they found was these standard theories of emotion, they don't seem rich enough to fully describe the diversity of responses you get um, when you go into like very fine-grained uh, feelings and emotions such as pride, um, romance, uh, satisfaction, and so on. So there is reason to believe we should uh, be doing much more finer grained uh, analyses. Um, there are, of course, risky applications. So this is a German company that basically conducts the whole job interview process automatically. Uh, you, instead of having an interview scheduled with a human, you have your interview scheduled with a bot. You log in, the bot asks you questions, and then it records your video feed while you respond to those questions. And while it does that, it's also scoring your personality uh, using the um, standard uh, big five uh, uh, scheme. And so this can be concerning because these are, we could, Computer vision uh, people know that these scores are quite unreliable and uh, people might be behave quite differently during such an interview uh, compared to their actual personality. And so uh, uh, intentionally or unintentionally because they're nervous and so on. So uh, these sorts of uh, systems can be, can be concerning, but there are various other applications that are less concerning. So right now there's a debate in AI. There are certain people who want to outright ban all forms of emotion uh, detection, emotion recognition. And they're basically saying this is unethical to do research on this because of such malicious applications. And then there are others that are saying, well, not all applications are evil. Um, basically those applications are evil, but not necessarily the underlying technology because it can be useful to quantify whether customers are frustrated, uh, uh, analyze social media and figure out what do people think about certain uh, societal phenomena, monitor movements, um, also what do people think about politicians and so on. Um, so there can be all sorts of applications and some might be uh, less malicious and 
in the humanities, of course, you also have a whole bunch of applications of these sorts of um, these sorts of uh, research. Uh, some I, I saw uh, one paper recently where people were looking at uh, emotion models to analyze uh, German TV series, and so they're basically just uh, trying to figure out how people react in different certain situations. And I would say that is a harmless uh, application of, of these sorts of technologies. There's also textual analytics like Luke, which uh, Babaji looked at uh, a little bit for, for a while. So quantifying uh, what kinds of words are used. Is there a lot of reference to um, oneself or to uh, third person or to a second person? Is there a lot of um, future uh, related uh, vocabulary or past uh, orientation? So these sorts of things can be useful as well for various kinds of uh, analyses. Another uh, related area that we looked into is uh, what do people think about when they see diff uh, some text in a font, when you use different fonts. Uh, so we took thousands of fonts, turned them into small little images, and then fed them into one of these deep convolutional neural, neural networks that I mentioned. And then you get this sort of visual space where different uh, fonts are close in the representation space if they have a similar appearance. So with that, you're just at the visual level. But fortunately, there was a data set uh, connected uh, collected by Adobe and University of Toronto, where they asked people to rate different fonts based on a whole bunch of attributes, uh, not uh, just a few examples here, but there are many attributes like how happy is this font, how clumsy, how formal, and so on. And so with that, uh, we can then, given a certain font, predict what people are going to associate with it. Um, and we can do this now for any new font that you give us. And online, you can easily find hundreds of thousands of different fonts nowadays. So a lot of this work was also motivated by uh, basically the sister of one of my PhD students being a graphic designer. And they wanted to have help how to better choose the right font to convey certain kinds of, of attributes. And extended this work then specifically for emotions to find fonts that seem to work best for different kinds of emotions and um, with that uh, we can then automatically basically for any kind of text that you give us based on the emotions we want to co convey uh, given that text we can then automatically suggest fonts that the designer might want to use. And the same thing can be extended to color as well. So different colors evoke or are associated with different kinds of emotions. And for some emotions, fonts work quite well, like for seriousness, um, trustworthiness, uh, disturbingness. For others, the color palettes seem to work well. And um, you can combine both of them. Uh, by choosing a suitable font and color scheme. And so here you have a more optimistic, serious looking one. And then here you have two different movies, one more um, entertaining, happy, one uh, more uh, orbit. Uh, <laughs> so with this, uh, basically, we can also uh, predict how people will react to, to certain kinds of uh, uh, perceptions. And then we can use that to make suggestions. All right, so the next topic I'm going to talk about is uh, interaction. Um, so we mentioned this a bit before. So it's very important to interact with, uh, with the real world to have something that comes closer to, to human-like uh, understanding. Um, and this is also important because a lot of what I showed you so far was based on this standard scheme that first we have to go ahead and label a huge amount of data. 
And once we have done this laborious uh, labeling process, then we can train a model to help us and automate some of this uh, uh, labeling. And the problem is that the more complex your pipeline is the, or your network, the more labels you typically need. So some of these deep neural networks, they need over a million examples. It depends on the task and how difficult it is, but sometimes it's just not feasible for a regular team of a couple of people to label uh, that many or have funds to have other people label them. And so this is uh, something that we've been trying to overcome also uh, in recent years. So the first things you can do are very simple data augmentation tricks. Like if you know that this is this has been labeled as a cat, well then if you rotate the image, all the rotations should also be labeled as a cat. And to the computer, to us, it might seem kind of trivial. I mean, of course, they're all cats. But to a computer, once you rotate it, suddenly the image looks different. Suddenly, this convolutional pattern no longer matches because it's shifted. And so these very simple tricks already help a deep neural network to figure out that, OK, it doesn't matter whether I see this furry pattern in this way or tilted or uh, whether I see uh, a zoomed in version. And so there are a whole bunch of data augmentation tricks that, that people have investigated. Um, all right, so some of them here, like crop and resize, change the colors, um, cut out a part of the image, and then it's probably still a dog. So these sorts of tricks uh, have been used now for, for longer. Some of the more recent work has been, can we just completely automatically generate training data? So some people are looking into just uh, render artificial images, and then we know what we rendered in these artificial images. So we have basically the labels. So you're using 3D modeling, uh, rendering techniques like ray tracing and so on. And then based on that, you just generate your labeled data. And this is something that can also be used for self-driving cars. Um, and then another idea is, well, what about uh, learning, changing the way the model learns? Instead of learning from the real label data, what if we just teach it general understanding of what is in an image um, without having labeled data by making up new tasks? So our regular tasks have real labels, but maybe we just make up these artificial tasks and now the model is encouraged to figure out like start guessing certain things about the image. Like if I cut out a part of the image and now I train a model to recreate what is was probably missing in that part of the image, then that seems quite hard. But as a human, you could also start to paint out some parts of it, maybe not perfectly, but a computer also will not be perfect. It will generate something slightly different than the actual ground truth. But by doing that, by trying to do this, and by learning how to do this, the computer gradually gains an understanding of what is going on here. What do people look like? People have legs, but above the leg, there's a body. And how is that body shaped? And so with these sorts of tricks, these artificial tasks, the computer is gradually learning how different objects look, how different uh, pictures are composed. Um, there's also a version of this called contrastive learning. So I take a picture, here a cat, uh, cut out parts of a cat or create, use some of these data augmentation tricks to get different versions of this original image. And now I'm just telling the system that these two images, they look to a computer completely different because they're from different parts of the original image. But I'm telling the computer that these two are showing the same thing. Um, they're both pictures of a cat. And so whatever representation you learn, it should have a similar representation for these two cut out parts. And that should be quite different than the cut out part from this dog uh, image. And so by 
repeatedly learning these sorts of distinctions that model just figures out how different things may look from different perspectives, different parts of a picture and learns some general, uh, gain some general uh, knowledge in quotes, I would say, uh, of what things look like. So then some of the other recent techniques are going beyond like uh, convolutional neural networks um, so there are models like vision transformers, where you take an image, you decompose it into parts, and now this part basically is just encoded like using a certain code that then allows us to treat this picture as uh, just like language, like textual language. So um, basically people came up with transformers, I'll talk about that in a bit, these are models from NLP. And they work really well, and I'll tell you a bit more about them later on, but they also seem to work really well for other tasks that have nothing to do with text. And so people are now figuring out ways to turn various other tasks into textual tasks. Uh, and in this case, basically you turn different parts of the image into a code that then can be treated as a sort of language of patches. And with this, the model then um, can learn from images and you can also start connecting um, images and text in a single model. And so that gives us then some new advantages because we can pre-train on huge amounts of data, um, huge amounts of text that we just find on the web and huge amounts of images that we just find on the web. And Gradually, the model gains an understanding not just of what images look like and what is in them, but also of what objects uh, or, or wor words are used in text. And over time, with some extra data, it can also learn the relationship between pictures and text. And this can then be used in various ways. Um, one other uh, or related interesting thing is nowadays we can by training a model just on the web, on huge amounts of web data, we can classify what is going on in an image without having trained uh, a model using label data for the different classes. So we basically just feed in a text, uh, a bunch of different images, and we can check then how close is each image to each text and that idea we can then use to um, feed in an image, feed in a bunch of possible labels, and the labels get turned into the sentence, a photo of a plane, car, dog, bird, whatever you want, and the computer will then, the model will predict that this is probably a photo of a dog. And so this model did not specifically, we did not have to train it ourselves with labels of dogs, but it's just taking all this web data, everything it has learned about the world from text and images on the web. And now we can also plug in our new kinds of labels and see if it can achieve a classification. Um, it wouldn't work for something very specific, like this is a photo of my grandma or something like that, but uh, unless it just is looking for gen generic grandmas, but um, this is, uh, uh, you can basically extend this to arbitrary classes that are sufficiently frequent uh, and generic. And you can also, and so this works quite well, even for things like guacamole and more specific things. And you can also give it a whole bunch of candidate, candidate uh, textual descriptions and see which one um, matches which image. So it's not just single labels, but any sentence and so you can see which sentence or which description matches which image. Um, and this model is nice because OpenAI made it freely available so you can just play around with it and um, see what it gives you. Um, so they spent huge amounts of money to train this. That's another aspect that no one, none of us could easily train this sort of model um, using our hardware uh, restrictions, but they trained this one very big model on huge amounts of web data and now anyone can use it. 
And related to this project, they then also had an extended version where you generate images. So the basic idea is that of autoencoders, um, if we have a neural network that takes an image, learns some sort of representation, and it needs to learn a representation that allows it to recreate the original image. So that's how we train the model. Can you, like initially it might choose any kind of representation, but we require that the model tries to recreate the original image from this representation. So over time, it will get better and better at choosing representations that capture the key information in the image. And so with this, it can basically learn a good encoding. But then we can extend this with a transformer model again, these textual models to feed in now a text that says the face of a giant panda, panda chewing on some bamboo. And there are a lot of technical details here that I'm skipping, but basically you can give it any text, any short sentence, and it tries to generate an image of it. Um, it doesn't work for very complex scenes, mostly like single uh, objects, but the nice thing about it is these can be single objects that combine different things. So you can say, this is something that's been on social media a lot. You can say an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And then it seems like the model has learned to creatively combine different ideas that um, weren't there in the original data. So these are new combinations that it's generating on its own by combining different kinds of concepts without having seen specific examples for it before. So this is their DALI model. All right, and then the next frontier seems to be learning from video. Um, basically, people are uploading hours, many hours, hundreds of hours of video every single minute. And so all of this is very rich data and basically should enable a computer to learn things about the world, but it's challenging because it's, it is so much data that uh, it's hard to deal with. Uh, you would know <laughs> all these problems dealing with large amounts of data. Um, there are different kinds of applications we hope to have, like simple augmented reality while you're traveling in a city you don't know, get uh, additional annotations, see the world differently. Um, so just labeling things, but a deeper motivation is also this aspect that you mentioned that whenever I said understanding, it's very far from what, uh, what we humans mean when we say human understanding. And um, these approaches are not quite gonna get us there, but at least they'll get us a bit closer to towards some kind of grounding. Um, so one nice thing is that videos often contain speech and the speech then relates, we know exactly when the speech occurs. So whatever the person is describing must some is probably somehow visible in the video feed. And so the model can try to start learning from these patterns in the data. Um, any single instance would not be accurate enough. I mean, sometimes the person is just standing there talking about their, their weekend, but you don't see that in the image at all. But if you take huge amounts of data, then eventually the model would, would learn something useful. So if I trained um, one model with lots of cooking videos and another model with a lot of, lots of carpentry videos, the models might have a bias towards making meaning um, towards cooking or carpentry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is an issue of how do we actually deal with these imbalances that like, if you look at what kinds of videos people are uploading, uh, there, I mean, there's huge amounts of videos of people playing video games and just <laughs> streaming that. And so, <laughs> That would be a very biased view of, of the natural world. And so, um, and the same thing happens also for languages, like we're training now these multilingual models that learn from English and German, and we're dumping all the languages together in one single model. And it 
does work well for common languages, but then the rare minority languages, they get drowned out. And um, so people are looking into tricks, like just sampling, uh, increasing the frequency of those, upsampling some of those lower frequency events. But we don't have very good solutions for this. Um, it's a generic problem that, I mean, basically any data set you create is imperfect because there is no perfect balance you need all kinds of balances like gender balance cultural balances uh, activities scenes scene types uh, different types of cameras and so on so um, it's basically not easily solvable but the hope is the more diverse things the system sees the more it will have I mean, these systems have also a large capacity, so they can memorize a lot of things. So at some level, they can also remember certain things that are rare and but seem important and store that even if they only saw it a few times. But we're still kind of figuring out tricks to make this work better. I'm thinking about people, you know, they say you go to an orthopedist and they'll talk about an orthopedic solution you go to a carpenter and they're talking about doing it wood you go to a painter and it's like well i'm going to paint it this way so people have that right right yeah i'm people have it all the time right you know like you uh, give someone a hammer they want to hammer everything the nail right? right that kind of thing so that's i find it fascinating yeah these are these are some big debates right now and how do you deal with these imbalances um it's a, we don't have good answers for, for this uh, so far. All right, and so yeah, people are creating versions of transformer models that basically combine text and video, uh, parts of the video into a single model. And there, there are many now uh, approaches for this. And we're hoping to be able to just learn from raw data without having to label anything specifically. Just take the data as we get it on, from YouTube and elsewhere and combine different kinds of data and learn from it. Um, there are also uh, other kinds of uh, things going on, like research on gestures, signs, um, uh, cultural differences in gesture, of course, uh, and all of these issues. Um, one topic that uh, yeah. I think is quite interesting is sign language recognition. Um, so that's something that's been uh, coming uh, and uh, uh, become more practical. And so this is a very nice development um, that this has been uh, getting better and better and also um, enabling new uh, other kinds of assistive technology. So ultimately, we want to somehow learn from the instances where something in the image is really relating to something else that is being said. And that way, we kind of we at least figure out, okay, this, uh, I mean, the way humans do, uh, when you're teaching a child certain things, you're pointing and you're labeling things and so this way we hope that in all of this data there will be uh, sufficient instances where it's quite obvious what they're i mean when you're talking about a certain thing and you have this object focused uh, in the picture that this is what you mean and so the, hopefully the computer will be able to pick up on these instances and then generalize the way humans do when a similar object occurs in another video where it's not as clear which uh, object they're referring to when they're talking about the laptop or the phone or something. All right, so probably some of you have seen this sort of uh, video. So uh, uh, very interesting how important uh, indexicality can be just pointing and stuff. And, um, and so one thing that people are looking at also uh, this is not our kind of our kinds of research, but uh, automatic IKEA assembly or sort of human machine collaboration to uh, assemble uh, IKEA furniture. Um, 
And so the robots do certain things, but the human needs to help with certain things the robots cannot do. Um, and, but these are prototypes and maybe in a few years we'll have uh, very nice uh, uh, devices you can just rent out from Ikea when you buy your furniture. Um, other things that people are doing are um, giving instructions to uh, devices, so drones, um, talking to, being able to talk to the drone and refer to very specific things in the scene. So here you might say, uh, take a right towards the small white bush before the white bush take a right and head towards the right side of the banana. And so the system needs to understand all these complex uh, references. Um, what is the banana? What is going on? And so this is a bit more challenging than just making sense of an image because you need to keep track of the whole 3D environment and track objects over time and then also keep track of uh, relative directions, um, which can be confusing even to humans. And so some people are working on this, representing your current state, where are you now in this space? Um, and then there's reinforcement learning where you where the system tries something and if it succeeds, it gets a reward. If it fails, uh, it may get a negative reward, so penalty. And then over time, uh, it tries to get better and better at things, although Unlike in regular learning, you don't get necessarily immediately an, a reward. You might have to first do many, many steps until you actually get to the goal and get your reward. All right, so yeah, and then personally, some people would say this is a step before the real world. Um, to me, it's not so clear. I mean, Going to virtual environments will be the step beyond the real world because first, when once you have a virtual world, I mean, things are not as realistic as in the real world, but the nice thing is the system can be much faster at trying out things and making mistakes and learning from the mistakes. Um, so you can easily simulate millions of runs of a system trying things in such a 